Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Paul, and in this short gaming Telecom video, we're further going to be discussing the impact of Meltdown and Spectre. Yes, there is yet further updates concerning this, not just from Intel, but also additional benchmarks which have been released, insights from Apple, and much, much, much more besides. So we're going to start things out with Intel, because they are still under a deluge of pressure at the moment. First things first, and probably surprising zero who are listening to this, they are bracing for an avalanche of class action lawsuits. With owners of the processors in California, Oregon and Indiana, who have filed separate complaints which have alleged that Intel have sold vulnerable processors even after the discovery of Meltdown and Spectre, and therefore the chips were being sold as inherently faulty. And yes, while of course you can apply patches, the bottom line is the patch does affect performance. We'll get into how much in just a moment because some updated benchmarks have been released, but even at the best case scenario, let's say that your particular application is only slowed down by 1%. Well, that's still negatively impacting a performance number, which according to these allegations is due to a fault in the chip itself. And don't forget that Coffee Lake was being released well after Intel knew about these issues. Just as a reminder, Google uh, informed uh, Intel of these vulnerabilities of both Spectre and Meltdown in mid 2017 so once again that's way before the release of coffee link and so we have already security researchers who have said that it will indeed impact intel's reliability and let's just be honest it's not particularly far-fetched to see that these lawsuits are going to become more numerous you might recall that intel's statement did try to downplay the performance drops that they um, we're expecting customers to actually be faced with, but the problem, as usual, is it is heavily workload dependent. I'm going to link a series of benchmarks in the description of this video because I find the results really interesting. We'll start with some game tests. Uh, this is from uh, TechSpot. You can see that Ashes of the Singularity Escalation at 1080p on a GTX 1080 Ti with an 8700K. Uh, essentially is identical in frame rate, just a couple of frames per second difference. And indeed, the same could be said for Battlefield 1. DirectX 11, 1080p, once again on the 1080 tie, at medium settings, and the frame rates are basically identical. And even Tomb Raider 2016 at 1280p, this is according to Guru3D, if you run an i7-5960X at 4.2 GHz pre-patch, it was getting 193 frames per second, but post-patch, you're looking at a significant drop, and by significant, I mean 4 frames a second, down to 189 frames a second. So, not exactly going to cause any problems at all. The only people who might be affected are those chasing 3D Mark scores. For example, on, once again, Guru3D, you have the 9,208 of the post-patch, which is actually faster than the pre-patch, which is 8,970. The good news continues as well with Cinebench R15. You have 1633 on, once again, the same CPU, 5960X, and Guru 3D report just five points lower, post-patch, which is 1628, with the 8700K similarly affected. But that's where pretty much the good news ends. It really appears to be the storage benchmarks, which are uh, things which are being hit. In particular, if we look at TechSpot with the Atto Disk benchmark at 2GB, this is with the SSD 950 Pro 512GB from Samsung, well, you can see right there the performance numbers, and they are not you know, terrible or anything like that, but they are definitely being hit quite hard after the patch. So those benchmarks, as you probably ascertained, are good things for you and I. In other words, for those who are not running their computers as a data server. So in other words, probably for 99% of people watching this video, the performance is lower, but for most tasks, it's going to be within the realms of acceptability. Things change a little depending upon the actual environment you're running things in. For example, users 
running AWS or Amazon Web Services with an EC2 instance have definitely detected problems. And there is actually a discussion thread at the AWS forums. I'll link to it for your perusal. One user has said that immediately following the reboot, my server running on the instance started to suffer from CPU stress, looking at CPU stats. So there's a very clear change in daily CPU usage pattern. Despite continuing normal traffic to my server, I performed an extensive review of what have changed on my server configuration, but drew a complete blank. Configuration of the server did not change. Tim Gostoni has also released a tweet which demonstrates the performance of a AWS EC2 instance running Linux, and this is on a T1 micro and an M3 medium instance. The good news is, however, that um, Amazon Web Services have told the register that they don't expect meaningful, meaningful excuse me, performance impact for most customers, but there may be some cases where this happens and they will try to work with the customers to mitigate the issues. Continuing with a different company entirely, and this one is Apple, uh, and also, of course, Apple are quite a unique case because they also utilize not only ARM, but also Intel processors, and they have a full public press statement. I'll also link to that in the video description. And they have said that they believe that performance reduction is going to be about 2.5%. I'll read out a small quote. Our testing with public benchmarks has shown that the changes in December 2017 updates resulted in no measurable, measurable reduction in the performance of Mac OS and iOS as measured by Geekbench 4 benchmark or common web browsing benchmarks such as Speedometer, uh, Jetstream and Ares 6. Spectre is a little bit different on the other hand. According to them, I'm going to read this out verbatim, Apple will release a update for Safari OS on Mac OS and iOS for the coming days to mitigate these exploit techniques. Our current testing indicates that the upcoming Safari mitigations will have no measurable impact on speedometer and RE6 tests and the impact of less than 2.5% on the Jetstream benchmark. Meanwhile, our other friends over at Microsoft have issued a statement that said regarding Azure, the majority of Azure customers should not see a noticeable impact on performance, but they did give a caveat, and that was specifically to customers where the workload is heavy on the network. <clears throat> In which case, Microsoft suggests you turn on Azure Accelerated Networking to mitigate this, but the problem is, if you've already got that enabled, well, you're not gonna notice a speed up. So what vulnerabilities have patched and whether there'll be more patches coming has also not been mentioned. Others in the industry are also weighing in. Linus Torvalds, after his uh, rant on Intel, where he basically said that their processors are crap. Those are his words. I'm actually somewhat underplaying what he said. Uh, he suggested that around 5% slowdown should be typical in most instances. Willie Taro, on the other hand, who is the CTO of Haproxy and also is a contributor of the Linux kernel. He reported that about 17% slowdown was what he was expecting, and the worst case scenarios once again have been pegged at around 30%. Truthfully, I think that this is going to continue over the next several weeks, because we still don't have all of the answers. I think it's going to take a lot of analysis on those who are working on large virtual machines in server environments and even to be honest with you um, more applications as well because while we are seeing stuff benchmarked and whatever we don't have it over a large enough range of processes with a large enough configuration of PCs with a large enough configuration of operating systems and a large enough configuration of usage scenarios for example okay we see the you know various software benchmarks being conducted on for example Blender or Adobe After Effects or whatever. The question is, what starts happening if you're multitasking? For example, uh, what about if you're a gamer who perhaps had, um, perhaps you're a streamer, perhaps you're doing some encoding while at the same time you're, um, you know, playing a game while at the same time you're live streaming to Twitch or whatever, or even people who perhaps are doing, I don't know, high end render work so for example you're exporting slash uh, encoding to one hard disk from another hard disk so you've got uh, adobe 
uh, uh, sorry, Adobe Photoshop open as well. Perhaps you've got uh, a project there that you've, you're working on. Perhaps you've got another project as well in, say, 3ds Max. You've got loads of processor cores on an X299 desktop, plus as well loads of RAM. What's going to happen there? What type of performance impact you're going to have? Honestly, we just don't know yet. I'll also point out that ARM have released a pretty comprehensive table which indicates what processors of theirs are vulnerable to what variant of attack. Remember, there are three or, I guess, four variants if you decide to count their free A here. Uh, so, for example, the Cortex-R7 is vulnerable to variant 1 and 2, but is not vulnerable to variant 3 and 3A. Whereas the A75 here is available to variant 1, 2, as well as 3, but not 3A. Intel, meanwhile, have also decided to release a list of affected products. These range from the i3 processors, which were the 45 and 32 nm, also the second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth generation of Intel Core processors, a whole bunch of Intel Xeons. I'm not going to re read those out because I'll be here until doomsday. Uh, some Intel Atom processors, for example, the uh, processor X3 and the Z series and some Celerons and some Pentiums as well. And so what you have to do with Intel, and this is where it gets a little more tricky, on pre-Skylake processors you need uh, kernel measures, whereas on the other hand if you have Skylake or later you need a microcode update as well as a kernel countermeasure, and this is going to be known as indirect branch restriction speculation also known as IBRS, not Irritable Bowel Syndrome, to kill off Spectre 2 variant. So what is left, however, is Spectre 1 variant, which is much more difficult to actually patch. We'll get to that in a second. Um, so just a clarification, that's for Spectre. Um, so we're left with Spectre variant 1 and variant 2. Variant 2 has been pretty much resolved. Variant 1 is harder because what you really need is to actually re rebuild an application with countermeasures. And those countermeasures haven't been released at least fully yet. And then finally, of course, we've got Meltdown, which is the one that most of us are concerned with in regards to the performance. And this, of course, is also the kernel page table isolation, which is one of the reasons that we've had so much performance issues. Boy. So this is... This is going to get messy. Honestly, I'm surprised some websites, and I'm not going to name who, have actually been so nice to Intel. Like, some of them were actually really reluctant almost to, to call out Intel. Uh, I, I don't know what was going on there. I'll leave that to your imagination. Um, uh, it's The bottom line is, even if the performance results are very minimal, uh, sorry, the performance differences are mi very minimal, the fact of the matter is people are frustrated they feel that their performance is going to be affected they felt that you know fair enough if it's an older architecture if it's like haswell perhaps even skylake or even kaby lake intel probably weren't aware of this like it's it's fair enough if you didn't know about a vulnerability you can't protect against the vulnerability so in intel's defense while of course the creator of linux himself, linux himself uh, has been very skeptical and very aggressive towards Intel. In their defense, if you have a bug and uh, you keep tweaking the same architecture, I can see how a bug will continue to be there. And, you know, everyone's human. I'm not going to be super critical on Intel on that. I, I don't I don't like it, but it is what it is. I can't fault them on it. If they didn't spot it, they didn't spot it. It's that simple. Um, for me, the bigger deal is the fact that they've actually released architecture after they knew about it. Um, and that is Coffee Lake, of course. And there wasn't any, you know, any anything at all. Now, in their defense, of course, one could argue, well, what are they supposed to do? If they were to tell everyone about this, you know, people are just going to start exploiting it. In other words, if they publicly announced this, on the other hand, they could have delayed coffee. They could perhaps have just put it on the back burner. Who knows? Either way, class action lawsuits and how this is going to get resolved is anyone's guess. With all of that said, hopefully you've enjoyed the video. I'll see you soon. Take care. Bye for now.